There are challenges with property management with any form of asset management. And the challenges, some of them are new, some of them are existing. Um, what, is sh what is clear is that those challenges make decisions more complex. And more importantly, makes the implications of making less accurate decision uh, greater than what it used to be. Um, some of those challenges, and we've spoken to a number of clients, there have been quite a lot of surveys done on LinkedIn by different organizations, just to summarize the high level items of challenge. Funding constraints seems to always be top of the list. Again, this is nothing new for the, for the facility management, for the asset management, property management, however you want to call this. Of course, these have been a bit more increased over the, over the past 24 months, 48 months. Changes in your revenues has implications on your budgets and so on and so forth. So the problem has been there and it will continue being there. There's always going to be means to be able to assess and analyze how we can deliver what we need to deliver with these set of constraints. At the same time, the infrastructure is used on a daily basis. So there's a wear and tear needs greater attention. So when you combine budgets, reduced budgets, with these challenges of infrastructure, um, it tends to make things a bit more complicated. Moving on to customer expectations, the customer, customer demand will never go down. It's always, it's always an increase. Whatever you provide customer, tomorrow they would want better. And that's a, a great opportunity to grow and build new initiatives and drive it. But ultimately, that's a, that's a, that's a challenge for day-to-day -day operations and management of the infrastructure, if you consider the other elements. So for those of you who are sitting here planning next 20, 50 years what the world would look like, some inside information will tell you that I don't think now, tomorrow, next year, or in 20 years' time, you'll ever have a customer come to you and complain that their current rental is, is, is too low. Can you please increase it? Or alternatively, no one will come to you and complain that their Wi-Fi is too fast. Can we please slow it down? The demand will only go upwards. So you have these three items, and then adding to that, you have the set of regulations. Again, these are for very good reasons. They mitigate very critical risks within the business, continuity, but yet they are a set of constraints, especially in your operational day to day. Needing to meet net zero objectives, looking at the waste management and meeting with those regulations, obviously safety, critical, your financial procurement, all of these regulations would mean that things need to be done in a very planned and structured way, and sometimes responding to specific failures adds a significant degree of constraints and complaints to it. So, to be able to respond to this, you need to have a good level of data and insight to be able to make right decisions at the right time, be it strategic decisions or operational decisions of how do we maintain the infrastructure? What do I do today when that asset has failed? Smart asset management doesn't start at the FM stage or property management stage. It starts at the whole life cycle. So if you have planning, design, construction, operation, and then at some point decommission or renewal, it needs to start at the very beginning. So in the original stage, when you're actually planning or doing the development designs, you need to start looking at the asset, asset management policies, looking at the asset operations and maintenance policies and strategies, and building the asset information model. Then moving on to the design and construction phase, this is where you need to be able to um, translate the asset information requirements into project information models and to be able to govern that through a, some form of a technology, be it common data environment or have a level of assurance so that the output of design and construction can fulfill the property management criteria that you would need later on to be able to deliver your O&M strategy. And if O&M strategy is about looking at predictive maintenance, reducing failures, um, world-class customer experience, and, and, and everything else that we hear about, then that needs to be considered in the design and construction phase, because you may need to require to install a set of sensors, feeders into your infrastructure to be able to enable that. And if that's not been designed or defined from the outset, the likelihood is that things may, be, may fall off the wagon, if you like, at this stage. Then when you move on to the maintenance, it's all about adding to that, to that information. Asset health check, understanding the status of your assets, being able to develop decision support tools to enable some of those decisions that you make on strategic and, and over operational stages, 
and most importantly, data and information is very similar to an asset. Your infrastructure is dynamic, the data is dynamic. The data that you have today must be obtained and maintained in a regular intervals as the assets you replace and renew to ensure that there is a clear line of sight between your information and the physical infrastructure. And sometimes this is also overlooked. Now, this is a, this is a perfect scenario. I don't think if I were to ask for, for show of hands as to how many of the buildings went through this cycle, there'd be very little hands, uh, hands put up. And there's a good reason for it. And I think it was, it was mentioned earlier that this wall can actually, it, it can be a, quite a good metaphor for how the real world works. There is design construction and there is asset management. And the handover phase is when things are left behind when project is gone. That's usually, uh, in, in a nutshell, uh, what happens. And there are some reasons behind it. The, 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 within the design and construction, they also have a set of constraints. And there are critical constraints, time-bound, cost-bound, supply chain issues. And sometimes, some of the items that we consider to be critical for operational maintenance may be less critical for the, the governance at that stage of the life cycle. That needs to be addressed, and there are some works going on into addressing that, but I think what tends to happen is you end up with the operations and maintenance phase, and perhaps quite a lot of the previous items haven't happened, or not to the degree that's required. So the next question is, how do you then look to address that? Now, we've done quite a lot of works with our clients, and there are different ways of tackling this. What we found is to be, we, we've, we found the approach that we found to be more successful than perhaps other approaches that we've used in the past. It's trying to take a four-step approach towards reach, reaching the outcome, and I will talk about the outcome. And if this hasn't been done, asset management strategy is an absolute must that drives the direction of how do we want to maintain and operate our assets, what, when do we renew our assets, what maintenance regime do we use for our assets, and how do we define that? We need to look at the key business risks. If I want to have this particular maintenance strategy, if I want to be reactive, if I want to be predictive, what are the risks stopping me from doing that? And once you go into that level, uh, you then start to analyzing what information and insights do I need to have? And this will come from your facilities management, engineering, um, to be able to define those items. And it needn't be a, a starting from a blank sheet of paper. There are quite a few standards out there that gives the, gives the bulk part of what's required. From this perspective, organization need to look at that list and define what gives me the value and what do we prioritize and how do we define those. And then asset information model. Asset information model is what you will use throughout the life of your assets. If you want to understand, if you want to have a 3D model, a digital twin, as they call it, that contains all the information that you want to drill down into a large building, into a particular floor, into a particular room, looking at what is the air conditioning unit within that room, that, is, that needs to be defined in your asset information model. And in a perfect world, that's done at the very beginning of the pre-design pre phase. But if that's not been done, it needs to be done at this stage. So once this has been defined, you move on to the, the collect phase. What is the data governance? What information do I need to collect? To what accuracy? And how do I govern and quality check that information before it reaches the consume stage? Looking at the complexity of it. Collecting information, if you have a building to collect information from, it's quite different to, let's say, an example of a royal commission in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, where we have buildings all across cities. And as a kingdom, it's a quite a large surface area, so as cities are by, by, by proportion are quite large. So how, what is the complexity of collecting that information? And then how do we collect it? Do we use drones? Do we use people? Do we use um, LIDARs, sensors? Multiple, uh, multiple ways of doing it, and every single project will be unique. And there's a clear assessment to be done at that stage to ensure that there's an optimum way to achieve that. Then we move on to connect. Collecting information, information is critical. Information provides you with the insight needed to make decisions. If I go to my doctor, if I'm not feeling well, they can just take the temperature and be able to diagnose something. If they want to drill down in more details, you might do some blood tests, scans, and so on and so forth until the root cause is defined. So information is critical 
um, for managing your assets, especially if you consider the issues that I raised earlier, constraints, budgets, performance, aging of the assets, customer expectations. So the more information you have, the more likely you are to be able to make some key decisions. Now, connecting the information provides an exponential um, benefits rather than having them in silos. If I have an asset that's failing, I want to know, first, obviously, I want to know where that asset is, what is it failed. I want to know the historic performance of that asset. Are there similar assets that have failed? What is the maker, model, and manufacturer of the asset? Do we have the components in stock? Um, have we done root cause analysis in the past? So the more information you have, you will be able to make much more decisions. Now, the person who is responding to that particular fault need to have all those operational elements to be able to make that decision. Strategic, contracts and procurement, finance, wanting to project how much money I need, they may need to have a much more insights of how many of these particular components do we have? Are we likely to see these similar problems? And the strategy de defines it. So connecting that information gives you that insight. And then lastly, to meet the objective and outcomes, it's about consumption. It's about enabling the users. We can do perfect step one, two, and three, but if the adoption is low, the benefits are not realized. If I take somebody's bicycle and replace them with a brand new car and expect them to go from A to B faster, they need to get into the car and drive it. Um, it won't change things otherwise. And we see that quite a lot. When we're dealing with large data, there needs to be a step change in how we actually present that data. Uh, they need, the end user need to be able to make sense of that information, to be able to digest it, to be able to use it. And the end users are different. Asset management organizations are all structured around the same objective. The value chain is to provide service to the customers, sell properties, generate revenue, and so on. But there's a, your contracts and procurement, your finance, your engineering, they're all users of that information. So when it comes to representing the outputs, the engineer may be very happy with seeing a representation of their assets. They may love a digital twin that's, that is very close to how they see the assets to be able to navigate through it, systems, assets, components, how they relate to each other. That would be critical for them. They may, they may like that. Finance may not. Finance might be much more happy with dynamic dashboards that can be able to filter, assess, and understand how how to benchmark, why is this particular job costing more than that? What have we done right in here that we can replicate there? Or how much do we need to spend on replacing these assets in the coming years? So having setting up the right working groups to be able to then derive the right interfaces to make sure that the information is consumed and the decisions are made based on that information is quite critical. And obviously the change management you cannot underestimate change management. If the solution is derived based on the user requirements, the, the, um, the uptake is, 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 is gonna be a lot higher. Is it gonna be perfect? Probably not, but it will be a lot higher. So the change management supporting, there is a transition for people, and they need to be able to understand the full journey to be able to associate with that change and to be, to be, to be more forthcoming with it. Just want to close out on potential some of the areas that we're looking to address or the organizations that should look to address. So being a smart asset management or data-led decision making should be able to enable you to meet these particular outcomes. This should be the end goal and we're working towards those. Efficiencies. As I mentioned before, a lot of clients that I speak to, their renewal budget is 20% of what it needs to be. So how do I pick and choose what assets do I replace and what assets do I reprioritize and defer? So being able to assess the right assets, that's increasing the life of the other assets. And how do I choose that? So that's the way the efficiency part of it comes into it. It's both CapEx and OpEx. It's all about uh, interfering before it fails. Not too soon, not too late. Performance, if you're, if you're, if you're targeting the right assets, we expect the performance to be, to be also managed accordingly. Reputation. If you're able to be efficient and have high performance, that's the customer expectation ticked. And by customer, I mean the end user and also your stakeholders and your shareholders. Regulatory requirements. If, you, if you're able to have short, medium, and long-term plans based on the asset insight, then it's a lot easier to meet your net zero targets or to ensure that you're complying with the HSC regulations because things tend to go wrong 
when you're reacting to a specific fault and shortcuts are taken. If these are long-term plans, medium-term plans, there's a much more opportunities to be able to mitigate those. And then resilience. If you're able to build a robust, medium, and long-term plan, the supply chain will be, will be queuing up outside your door to sign contracts. They like to have that level of confidence. They like to be able to plan their, their, their services long-term. And there's, an, there's a win-win opportunity here where you're certainly going to be able to negotiate a much more, much more affordable rates, and they'd be more than happy to comply with it on the basis of a long-term commitment. Increasing demand is another thing that you can, be, you can be managing by having a clear view of how you renew and replace your assets. What is the growth looking like? And therefore, do I replace them with like-for-like like, or do I want to change it? Will my like-for-like like replacement help me meet my net zero? Or is it going to leave me where I am now? And these are the opportunities that plan and look at the demand to be able to address those.